Some of you guys might be wondering if you need to know how to code in cybersecurity. You might have heard from some random YouTuber telling you that you need to learn programming in this field. So instead of trying to convince you guys with my thoughts and opinions, how about I just show you guys the type of coding and programming work that I do. So that's the topic of this video. I'll run through a couple of examples of some coding and programming type of work that I do as a security analyst in my team. This is so you guys can see whether or not you're interested in this side of cybersecurity. Before we get started, we need to understand that a security analyst or a SOC analyst is a pretty general role in cybersecurity. A SOC analyst can have different types of responsibilities. Some are in GRC, which stands for governance, risk, and compliance. Those are the type of people that deal with the wider picture of the business and focuses on managing risks and meeting the industry and government regulations. And then there's a common analyst role where you're just responding to alerts and incidents and triaging them whenever necessary. There's also people that focuses on vulnerability side of things, so stuff like remediating CVEs. And then there are the ones that develop stuff which is kind of where I fall in. It's a bit of a fine line between an analyst and an engineer, but my title is a SOC analyst, so let's just go with that. The first and most common type of coding work that any SOC analyst will encounter at some point is search processing language, or SPL. This is the main method to navigate around a SIEM. A quick summary of what a SIEM is. It stands for Security Information and Event Management, which is essentially a solution that allows you to funnel in all data from different sources to make sense out of it. Now, the reason why I call this type of work coding is because it's very similar to SQL. And if you know a bit about SQL, then you know that's the language you use to perform queries on databases. So Splunk is the same solution that I always bring up in my channel. I'm not sponsored by them. I just use them at work a lot. That's why I always bring it up. So I'm going to show you guys an example of how SPL works on Splunk. Over here, we can see this is the platform and this is the search app that we can start with. Here we can see an example index called user data. And then index is kind of like a bucket where you can just throw whatever you want in there and you can just retain it for a certain number of days. So every row we see here is an event and we can see the particular values that corresponds with that particular event. And we can see on the left side, there are different fields that Splunk has automatically extracted. So stuff like age, education, email, experience, the first name, gender, and so on. So usually what I would do is to put it in a table function to tidy it up so I can visualize everything properly. So what I'm gonna do is just put in the table function and I'll put in a default field for time, which is underscore time. And let's say I wanna display everything that we can see in the events here. So that means we need the first name, last name, gender, age, email, phone number, education, occupation, and years of experience. So now everything is displayed in a table, so it's a little bit more neat. So Splunk also allows you to do some processing of the data. So for example, if you want to change the field names, you can just do a rename. And let's say I want to rename the first name field as first underscore name. And same thing with last name. We rename it as last underscore name. Now we have the updated fields. Then we can do first name plus a space and then the last name. Let me fix this up. So I'm gonna rename this field to experience underscore years. All right, now that we have everything here, you might be thinking, what can we do with all this data? So let's say for example, management is asking for how many males and females are in this particular list. What we can do is use a function called stats, which is basically an aggregation function. And we can just do count by gender. And we can see that there are more males than females. And we can also change the visualization so we can make it like a bar chart or we can make it like a pie chart. And if we want to display more data in this aggregation, then we can just add something like the experience years. So now we can do a better representation of this by using a function called XY series. So we can put in the gender experience underscore years. So now if we go into visualization and we go into the bar chart. This can be a better representation depending on the requirement, but here we can see the number of years and the number of people in each category. So this is just a very simple example of how you can use SPL, which is very similar to SQL, which is kind of like coding, and how you can use it to navigate not only on Splunk, but other SIEM platforms as well. And if we want to create a schedule report or alert on this particular set of data, we can just click on save as, and we can click on either report or alert. And this is going to pop up a window and you can just type in the name. Or if you want to save it as an alert, we can just put in the title, description. We can set the schedule to run every hour, every day, or even by cron schedule. And there's a lot of options for actions. For example, if you want to 
run a script, if you want to send an email, if you want to send a webhook. So the next type of development work is building dashboards. And I'll show you an example here. So what I'm going to do is just create a new dashboard. I'll name it as demo. I'll select classic. So the purpose of a dashboard for me is to have a quick look at statistics on this particular system or particular data. So using the search from before, I can just add it right in. I'll click save as existing dashboard and I'll click on demo. I'll save to dashboard, do a quick refresh. And what I'm going to do here is just add in a time range and I'll set it to time range as the label. Let's do all time. And here we have the panel from the search earlier. So let's say this particular dashboard, we want to know the number of genders, the number of age groups, the number of experiences, and so on. We can just lay it out in the form of panels across this entire dashboard. So what I'm going to do is go back to the original search here. I'm going to go back to statistics. I'll remove everything up until the stats count by gender. So this is essentially just giving the same number again for each gender. So now we can just isolate the genders by just doing a search by gender, let's say equals male. So what I'm gonna do now is just remove the gender field so we are left with the number. And once we have the count here, we can just save it. I'm gonna label it as male. So now I'll do the same thing with female, save that. And now let's do the experience years make it into a bar chart. And what I'm going to do now is just to sort it by the number of experience years by descending order. And let's say we only want the top 10. Save that, top 10 years of experience. So now if we go back to the dashboard and do a refresh, we can see all the panels here and we can just line them up neatly and we can add in the color. And of course we need to turn on the dark mode, do a refresh. And there you have it. Now we have a simple dashboard and that allows someone to come in and have a quick look at the statistics. Now that we've talked about the front end of things, let's talk about how we're able to receive this log data into our SIM platform. I'm going to use AWS as an example here. Let's say you have an AWS account and you have some application which is generating some CloudWatch logs. This can be error logs, debugging logs, output logs, whatever you want. Our goal is to ingest everything into Splunk, but with a catch. We need the CloudWatch logs to be ingested into specific Splunk indexes based on the application name. This makes things a little bit tricky, which means we can't just plug in the pre-built template that AWS provides for a Lambda function. A Lambda function is an AWS service that allows you to run code without a server. Okay, so now we're gonna create a function and we can just author from scratch. Let's call it a demo function. And I'm gonna select Python because that's just my favorite. And let's create a new role with basic Lambda permissions. So that way we don't have to specify manually and miss out something. Okay, so now that the Lambda function is up and running, let's do a test and let's just do a print hello world, deploy it so it saves the changes. And we can just do a test. So how the test works is this event JSON down below is essentially the payload to feed into your Lambda function. So if we click invoke, it'll start running and it'll feed in and it'll say hello world. But for example, let's say if you wanna see what the JSON payload was, we can just replace this by, let's type in event, put it into a format and just deploy that. We do the same thing. And here we can see this is the exact JSON that we were looking at before. So let's say we want to create a different event. We can just configure the test event. And let's say we put A here and then let's put the value as apple, B for banana and C for carrot. Let's verify if it works. There it is. Let's add one more field to the JSON payload. So let's add in a new field called category and let's call it food. So now let's assume we want to send this off to Splunk. What we can do is do a lookup table. So the first thing we need to figure out is how we can direct the payloads to its corresponding indexes on Splunk. So we can use a dictionary here. So I'm going to put in the comment, use dictionary to direct indexes on Splunk. So what I'm going to do here is to name the variable as lookup table and put the brackets over it. This is going to be essentially a dictionary data structure. I'm going to put in the labels. So if it's a food, we want to send it over to the food index. And if it's an object, we'll send it over to the object index. So I'm just giving you some random examples here. Let's say another one is a car. Then we just put it into the index car. So now we have like a map of the categories and the indexes. So now we got to build the payload to send over to Splunk. Let's name this as payload and let's put the brackets around it. So in this payload, we need to specify the index, the source type and the particular event that we want to send over. So for the index, we can reference the lookup table above. So we can do lookup table and let's put in the event. So keep in mind this event here is just the whole thing. So we need to specify the category here to get the particular food category. So let's do a brackets around it and type in category. Now we need to do the source type. 
which is going to be a JSON format. So the last thing we need to specify is the event. So let's put in event and let's put in the event. Okay, now that we have the payload set up, we're going to be using the REST API to send over this payload to Splunk Collector. So that means we need to import the request library. So now we can just do a post request. And what this function will need is the URL, which I'm going to just say Splunk host name. It's going to be an example one. I can't use mine right now because it's not on the cloud, so it's not going to work. And for the headers, we need to put in the authorization. And this is going to be the Splunk token that you can retrieve from the data input on your Splunk cloud. And for the last part, we can just put in the data, which is going to be json.dump. And let's put in the payload. And that's pretty much it. I can't run this right now because my Splunk instance is not on the cloud, so it's not going to work. So this is just one example of the coding side of things that I have on AWS. If you've watched this far and you're feeling a bit lost and overwhelmed, then I have a solution for you. Zero to Mastery's ethical hacker and cybersecurity expert CareerPath is a step-by-step -step roadmap to go from beginner to getting hired in cybersecurity. They'll not only teach you the fundamental skills, but also help you build real-world projects and help you land a job in the field. If we take a look at what's being offered for cybersecurity, we can see a range of courses that from Python, which I always recommend everyone to pick up, all the way to Ethical Hacking, AWS Cloud, Network Plus, Security Plus, and AI in Cybersecurity, which I think is an emerging topic in this space. And their courses don't just teach you theory, but get you hands-on on building projects right away. For example, the portfolio website in the Python course is something I've personally done up for myself when I was job hunting, so this is going to be a really useful one for you guys. If you're curious about programming beyond cybersecurity, they have a whole range of courses on topics such as web development, AI, cloud DevOps, blockchain, business, and even life skills. And instead of paying for courses upfront, which can be quite expensive, you can just pay $23 a month and that gives you unlimited access to all the courses, projects, and workshops. That's less than a cup of coffee per day. And you also get access to the community of over 400,000 other students learning alongside you, which will be super helpful when you get stuck. At the end of each course, you receive a completion certificate to show to your recruiters that you have actually done your work and you're not faking it. The best part is you get 30 day money back guarantee. So that's basically no risk. If you're serious about kickstarting your career in cybersecurity, then check out the link in the description below. Now for one of my most common type of dev work is creating a SOAR workflow. SOAR stands for Security Orchestration Automation and Response, which is another solution that Splunk provides that allows us to create automations called playbooks. These playbooks, in a nutshell, takes in an input and then performs some processing and then spits out either an output data or an action for us to perform. So that's pretty much all the common types of coding, programming, and dev work that I do as a SOC analyst in cybersecurity. I just want to point out that this type of work is definitely not a requirement for you to land a job in cybersecurity as a SOC analyst. I'm simply just showing this to a specific niche of people, the people that enjoy software engineering work, that you can do something similar in cybersecurity. Let me know in the comments if you're also in the same boat as me, grinding away at this type of work in cybersecurity. And also let me know what kind of video you guys want me to make for my next video. Hope you guys enjoyed this. Thanks for watching.